Let's try again. Let's try again. All right. Let's try again. Sorry. Just this for ten minutes. Don't go backwards. Yeah. Okay, let's try again. alone, taken from Psalm 62.1, for God alone my soul waits in silence, for him comes my salvation.
Before Arian comes up to lead us in the word of prayer, one more song in Amazing Grace. Yeah? Thank you.
Sorry, I'm still used to it. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, let's uh, go together uh, in prayer. Uh, dear God, we thank you for this day that we are here together to worship you and sing songs to you. Uh, and um, thank you for your love and your blessings. And we pray for our hearts that it will be softened by the lesson and that we, that we will put the things that we have learned today into practice. Um, we just want to request for... Uh, healing for Caroline and for her fast recovery and for those who are sick among us um, that you will uh, lay your hand upon them and comfort them and heal them. Uh, and also pray prayers for Koya Land and his family. Uh, pray that you will be with them and guide them in their grief. Uh, we also pray for this church. Um, it's exciting to be part of this and uh, built it from ground zero. <laughs> Help us to be guided by your spirit. And in everything that we do, may we glorify your name. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Uh, let's take a three-minute break, hug and greet one another while we set up the com uh, computer. All right. Thank you very much. <laughs> Amen. Let's uh, let's get back to our seats. Thank you. Amen. Uh, let's get back to our seats. Shall we start? I think the people who are at home don't have anyone to hug. So I'll give you a hug now. Oh. Amen. Take a seat. Take a seat. Take a seat. Uh, today, communion will be at the end. Okay. Uh, and uh, so we're going to start off with the last part of our um, forgiveness series. Uh, you know, it's been a really good time for me to be reading this book together with many of you. And uh, I feel like uh, in the last few weeks, um, we, we ha I've had a lot of great conversations with different people through text, and sometimes through phone, about all the things they are learning in forgiveness, you know, the things they are struggling, struggling with, and we, we all share the same struggles. And I realized that uh, for the first time in a long time, uh, I have a, a big group of brothers and sisters where we are on a spiritual journey together, learning something together, growing together, you know, doing spiritual formation together. And I haven't felt this in a long time. I thought it was a really, really um, a, a grateful feeling uh, to have. I need to explain to you a little bit why I'm dressed like that, okay? It's not because Wee Kiong, every, every time he preached, looked dressed nice, nice. I also have to compete, you know? But it is for illustrative purposes. So later on, there will be a point, and then you will realize, oh, that's why he dressed like that, okay? 
So, um, you know, talking about forgiveness is very humbling. Uh, number one, I'm not a, a, a forgiveness expert. I'm only sh really sharing with you things I've learned from the Tim Keller book, yeah? And, and in the process, I've learned that forgiveness is a complicated subject. Not because the Bi what Bible to teach about forgiveness is complicated, but because we human beings are very complicated, you know? Um, our relationships can be complicated with people, you know? Our emotions can be complicated. The offenses that we experience can be quite varied uh, in seriousness, yeah? And uh, the way different people respond to the same offense can be very different as well. So how to apply Jesus' teaching for each one of us can be complex. And I've learned that we all have to struggle to, uh, to uh, struggle with the scriptures. We have to struggle in prayer. We have to struggle with the cross. Uh, we have to struggle with our own sins, looking at our own sins, yeah, fixing, and then fixing our struggle with fixing our eyes on Jesus, you know, so that at the end of the day, we can obey uh, God's commands, God's will, right? So before we continue, I'm just going to uh, do a little recap on the things that we've talked about so far, yeah? Uh, first thing is, we, uh, last, the last lesson, we looked at Matthew 18, the parable of the unmerciful servant. We looked at how the, the passage um, asks us to identify the, uh, the, the sin accurately, all right? Not to over, uh, over make, make sure your debt is not too much or not too little, you know? And that, that can be hard sometimes. And uh, we're also asked to learn to see the sinner the way God sees us. Okay, so that we can learn to be merciful the way the, the master was merciful to the unmerciful servant. Yeah? And also we learn that we have to learn to absorb the debt ourselves when we forgive. All right? It hurts, but it is nothing compared to how Jesus absorbed our debt at the cross. So we absorb the debt when we, in the time when we want to retaliate, we choose not to. That's, that's when we, we are absorbing the debt, you know. And we also learn that um, in order to forgive as Christ forgave us, we have to release people from their debt. And, and then uh, and if the offending party is willing to listen and acknowledge a sin, we must be willing to reconcile our relationship with them. So that was from the last lesson. Yeah? We also looked at the uh, three dimensions of forgiveness. You know, that is a um, forgiveness is not possible if we don't remember the vertical dimension that, that God forgave us our debt to God is much higher, and He showed us grace. And this ultimately is the, the source of our love and our motivation to forgive people and to reconcile with people, all right? Uh, in the midweeks, uh, we also looked at a few things. Uh, we looked at the uh, two stages of forgiveness from Mark 11, where Jesus says you have to, uh, when you are standing praying there, and you have something against your brother, forgive them before you, you, you pray to God, right? And then we looked at Luke, 7, Luke 17, where you have to go to the brother. Uh, in these two passages, you know, um, Jesus tells us different aspects of the, our dimension, different ways of looking at forgiveness. First, we have to forgive in our heart, then go and forgive and try to resolve, or restore our relationships with people, all right? And uh, in this midweek, we also talked a little bit about what justice means. All right, sorry, yeah? Sorry, uh, got to change the slide. Hey, it won't move. Ah, okay. So we talk about internal forgiveness and outward forgiveness, right? And also a little bit about uh, what justice is. Justice means uh, when we, a Christ, spiritual justice or biblical justice means when we confront a sinner, to speak, we speak the truth so that the sinner will not be ensnared by the sin, but be freed by the sin that may take hold of their lives or take hold of their hearts, all right? So uh, there are many other aspects in the book that I cannot, uh, of course, address, yeah? Some very, very deep thoughts, huh? uh, types of false forgiveness, you know? Sometimes we forgive people, but that's not, not real, yeah? Uh, barriers to forgiveness, what is the obstacles? Uh, granting self-forgiveness, Some, sometimes people find that very difficult. And it won't change again. Sorry, a slow, ah! True and false forgiveness, um, counterfeits of repentance. So a lot of topics. So I suggest you can uh, go and read the book and uh, 
pain won't change. Okay, it won't change. Misunderstandings, unforgiveness. Okay, too many points. Okay, I'll try not to put in so many points. All right. So, um, I have learned a few things that in order to grow in forgiveness, we have to all deepen our convictions on this vertical component. Understand how much we need forgiveness and appreciating the price that Jesus paid for us more. This, 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 the, the more we grow in this area, the more it's easier to have the, hor- the, the outward forgiveness. Yeah? But also, to, to grow in the ability to forgive people, understanding people also is very, very important. You know? uh, for example, someone sinned against you and you think, why are they like that? Why are they like that? And then you can't over that, overcome that. Why are they like that? stage yeah but if when when you start to understand people a bit more ah then maybe you can sympathize a little bit more understand a little bit more yeah so in that spirit uh the the last um i'm gonna start here with understanding our need for forgiveness all right and we're gonna go back to genesis chapter three so let, let me read this passage now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the lord had made He said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? (laughs) And the woman said to the serpent, oh, we may eat from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden and you must not touch it or you will die. You will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman. For God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. This is very important. Huh? She also gave some to the husband. So she shares. <laughs> Who was with her, by the way. So the problem with the husband is he was right there listening to the two of them talk and he didn't do anything. Ah, okay. So he was there and he ate it also. And then the eyes of both of them were opened and they realized they were naked, so they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, Where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and so I hid. And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? You know, have you ever wondered why, when Adam and Eve gained the knowledge of good and evil, their first reaction is they became ashamed of their nakedness What you know, and felt compelled to hide themselves? Why is the connection between knowledge of good and evil and nakedness? You know, their nakedness made them so afraid that they felt compelled to hide from God. It is as though when they gained the knowledge of good and evil, they came to realize that they might be evil, that they are no good. Maybe they immediately understood what they just did was evil because by deciding to eat the fruit that, make, that will make them like God, they were trying to usurp God's position in their own hearts. They were trying to play God, be God. It's good to, I'll be like God, ma. so I eat already, I'll be like, I'll be God. So maybe when they realize that, the knowledge of good and evil, I'm oh, sorry, maybe the knowledge of good and evil was simply the ability to understand the good and bad in their thoughts and their actions. And they realize this. And when they realize this, they become ashamed. And when they were ashamed, they hide, they hid. But before that, They were the same person. They were right with God, but there was no need to hide. So Tim Keller writes this in his book. In this famous biblical account, Adam and Eve sin and immediately experience shame and guilt, vividly depicting as a feeling of nakedness. 
depicted as a feeling of nakedness. They feel exposed and vulnerable and must immediately cover up and hide the truth of who they have become from God and from each other. They sense in the depths of their being that there is something wrong with them, something they cannot justify. Now they are desperate to cover up, to control what others see of them, and to hide the truth of who they are, even from themselves. So it's been said that at the root of why people sin or why people stay away from God is fear. Fear of being exposed for who we really are. We live in, with a feeling that life is actually not safe. And so we do our best to try to take control of our lives so that we will feel safe. We take control by maybe gaining wealth, maybe gaining power over people, or by building castles and walls around us, maybe in the form of money, in the form of career, in the form of achievement, but anything that will help us not feel vulnerable in life. Fear of being exposed is also the reason why many people cannot admit they are wrong or acknowledge or confront their sins even if the evidence is right before them. Because the truth can be too unbearable to face. Deep inside, maybe we are just like the emperor with no clothes. That's why we often fight tooth and nails to maintain it's not our fault, it's somebody else's fault. Human beings fear being exposed for who we really are inside and that people may find out that we might be empty. It's a very real fear because, especially if there's no one around you to make you feel safe. So that's why Adam and Eve quickly began to sow fig leaves to hide themselves, to protect themselves from their nakedness, fear of being exposed for who they really are. Fig leaves are very small. If you look at the, you know, go Google it. You have to sow a lot together. And I, you know, and I don't know what they are using to sow, but you have to sow a lot in order to hide themselves. And in reality, they are quite useless. So a lot of things we we do to protect ourselves is quite useless also. We don't feel safe. You may have a lot of money, you may have the big house, you may have the CEO of a company, you, you, may, you may build up the walls and you don't know what more you can do to build up your career and yet you still feel safe. Uh, not, you don't feel safe. You fear people finding out the truth about you. You still hide yourself, you still you know, wear masks and things like that. So, like, so the things we build is just like the fig leaves. You know, when I, when I think about this, uh, I, you know, I ask myself, you know, do you fear being exposed? I mean, become really vulnerable, revealing who you are to someone else deep inside. So here's the test. Is there anyone who really, really knows you inside out? Hears you and sees you? Who you... Uh, who, are you, no, who are you really, really open to in your life? Is there, or is there much that you hide from people? You know, when, when I reflect on this, I must confess to you, I have secrets. I have things I fear letting people know. A lot of thoughts. You know, I'm not going to confess them right now. Okay? Um, I think even though we have been saved, we too struggle with the fear of nakedness or being exposed. And I wonder, how do we hide ourselves? How do we hide ourselves from our spouses? How do we hide from ourselves from our parents, um, from our friends? How do we hide ourselves in church? What are the fig leaves that we try so hard to sow in our lives to piece together the protection? So he continues, Tim, Tim Keller continues to say, the human condition needs a spiritual covering. We cannot bear to have people get an unfiltered, out-of-control look at who we are. We are not proud of who we are in the raw. So we desperately look for ways to cover up and to curate a flawless image. We cannot bear to lose control of what people know about us. That is why Facebook and Instagram is there. We, sh we show people the, a kind of a filtered, you know, great life, your holidays, your, your children smiling and you know, all the best side of yourself, we show people. Uh, and, and you have seen those posts where, you know, in Instagram, 
Instagram and reality. Instagram reality, right? Where the where the beautiful woman look nice and then next one she relax and you know that's the reality, right? So our lives are often presented to show the most interesting sides in social media. He goes on to say, if we have nothing to hide, there will be no fear. But we have much to hide. Nakedness is a deep sense that there is something wrong with me, something imperfect about me, and there's something inadequate about me, and I'm not what I ought to be. What are the fig leaves that we sow for ourselves? Tim Keller writes in his book, he says, why do so many people work themselves to death to be successful? Why do some people have no boundaries and not able to say no to anyone and will do whatever others say, ask of them? Why do others stay unattached, not allowing any real friendship or committed romantic relationship to develop? Why are some people rescuers or have messiah complexes who are always trying to save people from crisis? Why do some live in a perpetual victim mode spending all their time blaming others for things they are unhappy about? Why do others engage in abusive behavior, living a life based on the principles of do unto others before they have a chance to do unto you? Why do people become religious so that they can condemn everyone else who do not have the same belief as them? Why do so many people like to spread slander and gossip on social media? Why do so many people want to convince other people that their opinion is right? Because all these are fig leaves to hide our sense of nakedness, our emptiness, our, the depravity in our hearts. Our perfectionism, that's a fig leaf. Our desperate pursuit of academic success, that is a fig leaf. Our selling our souls for careers is a fig leaf. Our desperately holding on to our youth is a fig leaf. Our desperate need for approval and attention is a fig leaf. We think that there's something so wrong with us that we have to hide it at all costs. We, yeah, we need perfume even, all right? So that was not the state, but that is not the state that God created Adam and Eve to be in, and it's not the state that God created us to be in. And so, right after... God realized they, they were naked and they were hiding. What did God do? He says, God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them so that they will no longer feel naked. God sacrificed an animal to make clothes for Adam so that they no longer have to feel naked and ashamed. But unfortunately, there's no way to go back to before they, they, they knew good and evil. Yeah? Now they know their sins. Now they have to wear these coverings in order not to feel naked. And that was God's kindness, God's mercy to them. But it meant uh, the life of an innocent animal or animals, depending you know, how, how much skin they had. And this act of God, this sacrifice to clothe Adam and Eve, is what he did for us also. So in Galatians 3, Paul writes, so in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. So we are all wearing the garments of the sacrificed Christ. So that now we really have no fear that we, can, we are naked inside before God. I can be my real self before God. I can be as ugly as I really am before God. Because when God sees me, he only sees me through Jesus. And that is also how we can see one another through the tuxedo or gown of Jesus Christ. So I'm wearing this today. Now I explain. Yeah? My, my wife bought this suit for me. I'll stand out here. You can see. Nice, nice. My wife bought this suit for me uh, a few years ago. Never had a chance to wear it. I, I once, when we first got married, I asked my wife, on a scale of 1 to 10, how good-looking am I to you? <laughs> the, I, I'll tell you the answer. The answer is 4. Okay, depending on your, your ego level, yeah, you may think that's high or low, I don't know, like, it's 4. Okay, I, I accepted it, like, you know. On a weekend morning, 
on a Saturday morning when I wake up and go for break, eat breakfast at the table, my hair is all standing up. I'm wearing a singlet. My glasses are all like that. And I'm wearing shorts. I go down to a two or maybe one. But if you get dressed up like this, nice, nice, huh? with this, I, can, I think I can go up to an eight. <laughs> if I go for a hair, 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 you know, do my hair a bit, maybe I'll go up to a nine. All right? Spray a bit of perfume and have the right occasion for it. If I walk up on the stage to receive an award, I think I can hit a 10. Yeah? So that, that hit me, you know. You, you look at me like that also, you think nice, right? This is Jesus Christ. This is the blood of Jesus Christ, the, you know, the body that was broken for me. So that when God sees me, he sees this. He doesn't see what's inside. And I went to an onsen in Japan. I was so scared of, you know, being naked with other men in there because I've got no upper bodies, muscle, you know, and pouch, you know. Yeah. So, but then you walk in there and all I see is old men look just exactly like me. <laughs> then I realize, uh, oh, not, it's okay. It's okay, you know. But this is Jesus' blood, Jesus' body broken for me. And it makes me look good before God. We're all wearing Jesus. And whoever you are, with your ugly side, your selfish side, your scared side, it's okay. Because God himself is willing to sacrifice his son so that you may be clothed with him and be able to walk with him unashamed because he loves you and he would clothe you with his son. And um, so I hope you see our need for forgiveness because we cannot feel free without the blood of Christ. So um, Tim Keller gives us three resources for uh, giving and receiving forgiveness. And he takes this lesson from the book of Joseph, uh, from Joseph, from the book of Genesis. So I'm going to read from here. Genesis 50, when Joseph's brother saw that their father was dead, they said, what if Joseph holds a grudge against us and pays back for all the wrong we did to him? So he sent word to Joseph saying, your father left these instructions before he died. This is what you are to say to Joseph. I ask you to forgive your brothers the sin and the wrongs they committed in treating you so badly. Now please forgive the sins of the servants of the God of your father. When their message came to him, Joseph wept. His brothers then came and threw themselves down before him. We are your slaves, they said. But Joseph said to them, don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good, to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. So, that, so now, don't be afraid. I will provide for you and your children. And he reassured them and spoke kindly to them. This is the first time in the Bible that forgiveness is spoken about. And uh, Tim Keller draws our attention to the attitude of Joseph that we can all have. Number one, am I in the place of God? Did Joseph have the right to be angry? Yes, absolutely. But he said, am I in the place of God? Am I God? No. Joseph was the greatest man in Egypt, second only to Pharaoh. And yet, he would not play God. And he was not willing to be the judge of people. He let God be the judge. So this was a man who chose to be humble. Joseph was saying, the only way I could stay mad at you is if I consider myself worthy to be your judge. But I am not. So the reverse is, anyone who remains bitter may be saying, I am God, knowing good and evil, and therefore, I can judge. So the challenge for us is to learn from Joseph, to be humble, and to say to ourselves, I am not God, and I cannot judge you. 
all right? I'll leave that for God. And there are scriptures in the New Testament that says that as well, yeah? Second lesson from Joseph. But God intended it for good. Joseph had also had the wisdom to know that God has the ability to turn tragedy into blessings. In fact, he could see it already. He suffered a lot. But he could see that if he had not been betrayed and suffered, he could not save his people from famine. He could see that how God had used him to save Egypt and in turn his own people. So when we struggle with forgiveness, very often we are struggling to see things. We're seeing how God can turn a bad situation into a blessings. We cannot see that people might one day change. We cannot see the situation turning for better one day. We cannot see ourselves becoming stronger, uh, becoming more spiritual, more loving. We cannot see that one day we can be completely, we can have completely honest relationships with, our, with, with people in our lives and not fear being naked. It's very difficult to see this, all right? You know, so I've shared with you a few times that, uh, you know, in, in 20, 2017 was a low point in my life. So by, by then, three couples had left my ministry and I really felt I have done everything I knew how to do and, and I don't know how to keep people faithful. So I, I started uh, uh, reading and I, I found this uh, uh, course in, in US uh, by Larry Crabb. I went to take it thinking that it would be, help me be a better discipler. But actually, it, 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 I, I realized I had to fix myself. There were many, many things about me that was wrong. You know, I had to change, you know. And, um, and so I, I learned many things. I came home, I shared with my Bible talk and different people. And um, I had no idea that there would be a time where I have the opportunity to share the things I learned with you, you know, in, in a time like this, you know. So it's, it's a little bit of, for, for me, uh, the, the Joseph experience that, that you know, uh, things, tough things I went through, uh, God allowed me to learn things, to grow in a way that I can help other people at a certain point in my life. And, and to see God working in ways I cannot imagine. And who knows how God is working through you, you know, in your lives, in your relationships, in the things you are learning. So the second lesson is, uh, that we can learn from God is, try to remind ourselves that God may, be, have, may have intended the, the difficult things that we go through for good. And we have to kind of have uh, more faith and more imagination for how things can uh, uh, turn out. And lastly, uh, he, he told his brothers, don't be afraid. This addresses our question of fear again. Yeah, A lot of why we struggle with forgiveness is fear. Uh, hang on a second. Yeah. Sorry, I, I, I can't see my I can't see all my all my notes. A lot of why we struggle with forgiveness may be fear. Fear of what? Fear, what if he doesn't listen? What if he hurts me again? What if he repeats the sin again? What if he can't change? What if it ne never gets better? What if he sins against me again and again and again? What if I'm disappointed again? I can't handle it anymore. I can't bear it. What if the wounds get ripped open again? Oh, I just can't handle it, right? So there's a lot of fear when we approach uh, um, talking, even talking about issues with someone we care about in our lives. It's a lot of fear. And, um, and, and the challenge that God seems to be telling us is don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Why? Because God loves us. It is the love that protects us. You know, that even if you do get hurt again, the love of God can cover over it. Yeah. Uh, when I, I when, at 19 years old, I decided I'm not going to get married. Uh, I, my, my parents' marriage was not great. And I was convinced that if I got married, number one, I don't know how to make sure my marriage don't end up in divorce. I have no confidence that I will be a good husband and I definitely have no confidence I will be a good father. Because when I was growing up, all my mother's friends are divorced. 
she always going to hang out with her friends, right? And then all the women sit together, chat, talk, 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 and, and as a child, I'll be with my mom. So listen to them talk. Lor. So either the husbands are having affairs or they are all divorced. All like that one. Okay? So 19 years old, I said, no need. I will never get married. And music will be my only love. <laughs> yeah. That was before I found out music doesn't love me back. <laughs> so I didn't want to get married. Okay, I got married. All right. I, the reason I got married is also because I saw in the kingdom of God a lot of marriages that were good. You know, that inspired me. That gave me a sense of hope. But I didn't want to have a child. But I had, I had my first child. And then I, I, when I held her, I thought, yeah, I can be a very good, good father. You know, when she was sick, I pray, for, you know, that God take away a few years of my life so that she can breathe, you know, and, and things like that. I can change diaper, I can pick up poop, all that, you know. But then I don't want to have a second child. I said, enough, la. the world is very messed up, you know. So this second child is here, right? So I tell, tell her. <laughs> so I told, I, I told my wife, why, why, why have a second child? One enough already. Then she said something, uh, she said, I want to have a child with you. Wow, like that. Win already, lor. <laughs> yeah? Uh, so why we had a second child? Because of love. My, my wife loves me and wants to have a child with me because of love. And love covers over a mouth, uh, chase, chase out fear, right? Uh, okay. So for us to overcome our fear, we have to tap into the love of God and we have to tap into the love we have with people. And that helps us overcome fear. Don't be afraid. So these are the three lessons. Um, what was number one? Uh? <laughs> Am I in the place of God, right? Uh, second one? God intended for good. And third one, don't be afraid. So now I'm going to close out with a few thoughts uh, from Tim Keller on practicing forgiveness in our lives every day. Uh, we're going to look at Romans 12. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. That means don't think too highly of yourself. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge. My dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge and I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing so, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not overcome, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. So Paul says this is how we have to treat even those who persecute us. Bless them. That means do good for them. Give them good in their lives. Learn to be happy for them, even if, 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 if something good happens to them, and be sad with them if, if they suffer through something. Don't pay back sin with sin. Don't take revenge. How can we take revenge in our lives? He talks about this. How we can somehow exact payment on other people. Make cutting remarks. This happens a lot in marriage. Keep bringing up the past. Be demanding of the person. Say they owe us. Punish them with self-righteous mercy to make them feel small. Talking behind their back. Run them down to others under the guise of warning people about them. Repaying the hurts in our mind or conversations again and again and again. Cheer for their failure or pain. This is how we can unconsciously be exacting payment on other people. Don't do that. That's what Paul, Paul is saying in Romans. So uh, Tim Keller gives us some practicals that, I, that he thinks can help. It starts and ends in prayer. Pray specifically about the offense and how it hurt you and take it to the Lord. Put it in God's hands. Take an inventory of all the ways you could exact payment from the offender. Each time you refrain from doing so, know that you are absorbing the cost and paying down the debt yourself. Decide to let go of any ill will. He says, 
this is a matter of your own will. You have to decide. You know. And then, this is very important. Pray for them. Pray for good to happen to them, even if you don't want to. And when you pray, your heart will soften towards them. Don't avoid them as far as you are able. Grant them what they need if it is within your power. And do things with humility and love always. Be like Christ to them. So these are his suggestions. I believe these are things, if we do it, it's for our own sake. It is for our spiritual formation, our spiritual growth. It is for us to practice before we get positive feelings. For us to be like Christ first before we even want to. We do it because we trust Jesus and we want to obey him first and foremost. Yeah, And he is our Lord. So this practicing all these things is our spiritual discipline. Okay? Uh, and so, at this time, uh, it's communion. Okay? Uh, let us take the bread and the wine and let's focus on what we look like before God. Like that. Okay? We are all clothed with Christ and we look great. We look like we are at a banquet. In fact, the Bible does say, you know, heaven is like a banquet, yeah? Let us understand that he has sacrificed his son to clothe us, to clothe us and we no longer need to feel naked. And we know that even those who sin against us, they need to be clothed with Christ as well. All right? So with that, our sisters are preparing the, uh, the bread and the wine. Let, let us go to God in prayer. Amen? Father, we thank you so much that uh, you have clothed us with Jesus. And um, we, you have uh, sacrificed him so that we don't have to be afraid of being naked, but we look awesome in your eyes. Help us to, uh, as, we, as we consider him on the cross and breaking his body for us as, uh, and, and, and uh, spilling his blood for us, help us to uh, learn that we are not you and we can leave judgment to you. And uh, we also want to learn that there are many things in our lives that you're working powerfully in our lives and uh, you're working uh, like, like it says in Romans, say for the, you know, to, to, to do good to the people who love you. And, and, and you can turn a bad situation into a blessing. Help us to have uh, faith and vision to see that. And uh, help us not to be afraid uh, of, of, of life, of the challenges that life throws at us. But uh, help us to see that because you love us, we can overcome that fear and we can, uh, we can love one another. And whatever challenges we face, we can, we can overcome it together. And uh, we thank you so much for blessings that you've given us, our families, uh, our, our walk with you, uh, our, our, our conscience, our debtless lives. And we, we, we just really want to uh, be happy and, and enjoy uh, this day and this life, just walking with you every day. We thank you in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, uh, one more song, and we will sing Lamb of God. Thank you. 
Amen. Thank you very much. So we're going to close out here with uh, some announcements, and then we have a great time of fellowship. All right. Good morning, everyone. Okay. So uh, I like the way Matthew dressed today, right? <laughs> Shall we conduct a poll whether we want him? <laughs> right. La last week when we did the poll, right, uh, someone commented to me, hey, this is very fun. Let's, let's try other things to poll about. <laughs> right? Because everything automatic come with a nice chart some more, right? And so maybe we'll poll whether Matthew should dress like that every single week. <laughs> Now, so uh, I really appreciate Matthew's lesson, right? Uh, and the point that hit me the hardest was when he talked about how we are all clothed with Christ, right? I was thinking about how an animal was sacrificed so that the skin could cloth Adam and Eve. And then now Jesus died so that we can be clothed with Christ, right? So, so really... Uh, Let's really be thankful for that. Thank you so much for the reminder. And uh, because of that, we can all come clean before God, right? And just as we can come clean before God, God can forgive us. We should really show the same forgiveness to people who have sinned against us. Uh, I appreciate how Matthew has taught us three sermons on forgiveness and conducted three midweeks as well, right? I, I, I think uh, a lot of us have gained from it, but we also know that... Um, Forgiveness is not just something that's going to be over because of three lessons and then three workshops, right? It is an ongoing process that we need to keep practicing in our lives. So thank you so much also for the practicals for us to really always think about. Now, I've heard comments from some people say, okay, I still have questions, right? I still need to talk to people. Uh, so continue doing that. Right, continuing asking different people for help, continue talking to people whom you feel confident with. Right. And remember, as we talk, it's not to get each other more and more aggravated. Right? It's not to feel more justified about our anger because I compare notes with you, you felt that way, but the way to oh, that means what I'm feeling is okay. Now we talk with each other with the goal of helping each other to be spiritual, right? With the goal of praying for one another so that we all can learn to forgive just as God has forgiven us. Amen? Right, let's go to God in the word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we just really want to thank you so much, God, for all that we have learned today, but not just today, but, but over the last few weeks, God, from the different sermons that we have heard. But also especially, God, on, on, uh, thank you so much for how we learned about forgiveness. Father, we have learned it we have studied the Bible, we know sort of theoretically what we need to do, and there's still so much more for us to learn. But Father, the practice of forgiveness itself, God, is something that God, we cannot do unless we turn to you for strength. God, Jesus has set the perfect example of how to forgive, and Father, we pray that God, we can imitate him. So that God, we can forgive people who have sinned against us. Father, we pray for your strength because God, we know we cannot do it on our own. Father, we pray that God, you will bless all of us. We pray that you bless this church, God, as you strive to be a church that is godly, that tries to imitate you. God, we pray that God, you guide us in all the steps that we take. All this pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. All right. Okay, so announcements. Uh, so this coming midweek, we are not going to talk about forgiveness anymore. Right? This coming midweek, we're going to have a prayer night. Okay, it's on Thursday uh, at 8 p.m. Now, and let's also fast on that day. Now, uh, if you can, right? I know some of us have got different medical issues, right? So gauge for yourself how you can fast, what time you want to fast and what you want to fast on, right? Have confidence that we can all in our own practice fasting, right? And then, uh, so prayer night, we're going to tune in after that. Now, you can break fast before the prayer night, right? Don't wait until after prayer night by the time you eat. 10 o'clock or something, right? Uh, so, breakfast on your own, right? And then after that, we can all tune in and we can pray together, right? It will be on Zoom. It will be the same link, but we will send it again for your convenience, right? And next Sunday, the service is again here. Next slide. Now, so uh, I want to give a 
update or report on our collection last week, right? So we made a few a request for free offering uh, last Sunday, and it is to cover February and March expenses. So collection period was supposed to end on Wednesday, but then some people still, hey, hey can I give, can I give, right? So it actually end on the, ended on the 3rd of February. So we had hoped to collect $5,000 and on that very same day on Sunday, we already exceeded $5,000. So it's really a reflection of all of your hearts, right? Thank you so much for your giving heart. And altogether, there were 34 donations uh, and then it all totaled 10200 So double what we had set up to collect. All right. So thank you very much, all of you, for your giving hearts. You know, I, when we were doing the collection, we said we have confidence in people's heart. We have faith. Right? And really, that has been demonstrated right, in our love for each other and for the church. Right? So what will we do with the excess amount collected? We use it to pay for the church expenses for the subsequent month right? because we don't collect already and then reserve, reserve until a lot. Now, we want to build reserves right, uh, for emergency purposes, but we want to also use it to cover the church subsequent month's expenses so that we don't need to keep making collections. Right? But what we don't know is what will the subsequent expenses be like. Okay? We will only be here until the end of March. Okay? After that, there will be a renovation for, I hear, four months. And then after that, if we do want to come back here, uh, I'm sure rental will probably double or triple right? once they renovated the whole place. Okay? So uh, we, um, as you know, we have been working quite closely with Pastor Manjan Church of Christ who rented the other rooms and then we rented this room. So they've been looking for other places as well since this whole place is going to be undergoing renovation. And when they do the research, they're saying, uh, Jinkai, don't expect you still get it for 550 every week. Okay, it's at least going to be double that or more. right? Uh, so they check out a lot of other hotels. It's going to be a lot more costly. So we do not know what the subsequent month's expenses are like, so we cannot project. But once we are able to find out, okay, we will let you know, right? And uh, what we want to do going forward, right, is to always be transparent about our finances. And uh, we will update the church on finances on a bi-monthly basis, not after a whole year and then show you all some accounts, right? Every two months, right? Why not every week? because our deductions are very simple. Every week, minus $550, right? So don't need to <laughs> update you all the time, right? Okay? Uh, and um, so, uh, and also because we don't have to talk about money, money, money all the time, right? Okay, as a church, right? So uh, we update on a bi-monthly basis, but anytime anyone has got any questions, you know, uh, do approach us anytime. And then, uh, yep, so that's it. Okay, that's all for the announcements. Let's break up for a time of fellowship.